Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Joe Vitale. Welcome to Zero Limits Living. Every week, I bring you information and inspiration to lift your spirits, to help you transcend what's going on, to help you accomplish whatever your dreams are. I am a guy who is questioning all limitations, whether those limitations are physical, mental, spiritual, or whatever you are making up in your mind to believe in. And I'm wondering, are there really any limits? This show is called Zero Limits Living because I'm probing. I want to find out. And I know some of you sometimes think, what about physical limits? What if you're born with a limitation? What if you have some sort of inbuilt, you brought it with you at birth problem that other people might call a limitation? What then? Can you accept that? Can you just roll over, play dead? Can you just stop? No, you can't. And my guest today is somebody that I'm meeting for the very first time, even though we've had exchanges that we'll talk about in the past. And this man has an inspiring story. He's not only inspired me, he's inspiring his own family. He's inspiring the people who are following him. He is writing books. He is creating music. He is making art. And he's actually going to be going back in time because he's building a DeLorean time machine. And what I'm talking about, I'm going to put my glasses on to make sure I read this, is Matt Parson. And Matt not only is a father, but he just is a father repeated. He just had a baby, if his wife did, a few days ago. He's an artist, he's a musician, and he was born with a disability called Herb's Palsy, if I'm pronouncing it right, Herb's Palsy. And it's one of the things we want to explore because it did not hold him back. We want to hear all about this and some of his successes and how he's using his mind to create real world results. This is all stuff you, the viewer, can adapt and use for yourself. So Matt, welcome. Well, thank you so much, Joe. It's uh... I can't believe I can't believe I'm talking to you. You know, this is it's, it's, you know you're, you're like one of my favorite authors, and I've learned so oh. much, so much from you um, with your audio books and you know your, your books and just everything. You know, it's, and, you know, so thank you so much for for inviting me on. Of course. Well, you've impressed me since day one. You know, when we first met, it was online and you were thanking me for things that I had done, which I, of course, I wrote my books, put them out into the world. And then whatever happens, happens. You were one of the things that happened and you wanted to thank me. And you did this wonderful piece of art and I have it here. I want to show it real quick. It's in the cellophane, so it may not be ideal. And I also wanted people to hear, how did you make this? What exactly is this? And before you tell me, I was so impressed. I had you make one for my partner, Lisa Winston, who we will be meeting and interviewing at some point. You did both of these. Yeah. How did you do these? What kind of art is this? So this is all freehand. So, um, I, uh, I'm not, a, I'm not a believer in sort of tracing. Um, and, and you know, what's funny, funny story actually, because I, so my degree is in fine art. So I graduated from university in 2006. Um, but I, when I was at university, something really weird happened. Like I basically lost all inspiration for art. Mm. And I think because I was going through quite a lot, um, and in my personal life and, some of the things that I was focusing on while I was at university was sort of, you know, I was getting really frustrated with like the wars that were going on and I wanted to sort of change the world through my art, you know, and it wasn't happening. And, you know, it's like people, I was getting more and more sort of depressed um, and angry uh, at the world. And then my tutors, you know, wouldn't like my work and they, you know, and so I just, I just kind of lost all inspiration for it. Um, but then after the COVID lockdown, I, I went on holiday with my wife and, and my mother and father-in-law. And I just had the urge, just had the urge to pick up a pencil. I don't know where it came from. Um, because it'd been like nearly 18, 19 years since I since I picked up a pencil. Wow. Um and I and I drew I drew a portrait, and that's what I used to love doing when I was in school. Um and basically, yeah, I just I, I knew that I could draw portraits, you know, it was one of those things that I really loved. But then when I sort of it was almost like I was in a in a dream. Mm-hmm. You know, it was mm-hmm. so um, hypnotic and it was just like meditation for me. And I got so absorbed in it. And ever since sort of that moment, I it just, I can't stop drawing. Um, and it's, it's all freehand. So, um, yeah, I, I, do, I make, um, yeah, I make, um, uh, what do you call them? Um, time lapses of the, of the, uh, of the, of the, the portraits as well. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it's important that when you're uh, producing work that you can sort of show the people 
that you're doing it for how it's how it's been made. So I, I showed you the time lapse of the one I did for you as well. And that's one of the things that was so impressive about it. That's one see, thing to see the art, but when you see the process of creating the art, first of all, how long did it take you to make either one of those? So the one I did uh, view was about ten hours. Ten hours, and yeah, the one of Lisa is it about the same? Or? Yeah, it's about the same. So because it's a similar sort of size, so usually this is that sort of size it takes about ten hours. Um, okay. So but I just sorry, Matt, come on. Yeah, well, there's so much I want to talk to you about, and I know I'm, I'm always nervous about my time. I have a very limited amount of time, and I'm gushing with questions and energy and enthusiasm, and I want to pick your brains and open your mind and find out everything you know and do it all in 45 minutes or so. So uh, that's when I you know, sometimes just interrupt. So what I need to know and to start with, I wanted people to see what you're doing with your art, but that is one of a lot of things you're doing. You are a musician. You are now a writer. You are doing your teaching. You're building the DeLorean. Uh, I want to hear about all of that. But we need to start at the beginning because I talked about the disability and, and it is called Herb's Palsy, correct? That's right. Yeah, Herb's Palsy. Yeah. What, so, what is Herb's Palsy? Let's define so basically, it. Um, I, was, I was a massive baby. Um, I was nearly 11 pounds. Um, hmm. So when I was sort of coming into the world, basically I got, I got stuck. Um, and what happened was to get me out, um, they pulled me basically by the arm. It's called it's shoulder dysplasia. It's also called um, brachial plexus injury. Basically, what happened is, is the nerves that sort of attached sort of here into the spine basically got got torn. Um, and some of them stretched, some of them severed, some of them reattached. Um, basically, it, it left my arm paralyzed. Um, wow. And, and this was back in the 80s. So this is the early 80s, 1983. Um, and there wasn't the research. Uh, you know, there wasn't the internet and, and things like that. Uh, so, you know, my parents felt very alone. They didn't know what it was really, or they didn't know what to do about it. Um, and, and so, yeah, so basically, you know, the doctor said, um, basically your arm's paralyzed, you know, you're not going to be able to do any sport. You're not going to be able to do any DIY around the house or play any instruments or anything like that. Wow. Um, wow, wow. Hold it right there. Hold it right there. At what point did you discover that other people were calling it a limitation? I mean, this is your life. You're being, you're born, you're awakening, you're growing up. You don't really know what the parameters are. You don't really know that, Oh my, I'm different at one. At what point did you realize, Oh, I am different. And this is called a limitation. Do you know what? That's that's a really good question because it is a disability. So I, you know, it's 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 a not necessarily a common disability. You know, it's it happens because of um, accidents of birth. Um, you know, big babies. Uh, it can also happen in things like motorbike accidents and things like that. Um, so it is it is te it is technically a disability, and so. You know, I could I could participate in the Paralympics if I wanted to. You know, and, and it's one of those sort of those sort of disabilities. So, I um my mum and my dad never wanted to call it a disability. So wow. I didn't know. This, this is a true story. I didn't know that I was actually disabled until ten years wow. ago. Really? Yeah, yeah. And, and how old are you at this point? I'm, I'm thirty eight. Wow. So when about when you were twenty eight? That's yeah, when. Yeah, only twenty. Yeah, yeah, mid, yeah twenty eight. Yeah, maybe a couple of years before that. So. Yeah, it was just one of those things that I had, um, but I didn't really know that it was technically a disability. Well, what did you consider it to be? Because you looked at the other people swimming or playing cricket or doing something, and you thought, I'm different. At what point did you feel, you know, I'm different in this unique way? Well, to be honest, it was, it, it was at school, um, and mm -hmm. it wasn't in best of ways so i kind of I've, I've, I've written a book um which uh, which i finished a, a week or two ago and I, I kind of talk about this and that and i got picked on quite badly when i was at school mm -hmm. um because of the way my 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 arm hangs you know it, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't straighten out it's it's uh, the muscles are smaller than the other one mm -hmm. and i've got limited movement so i did regain about 60 percent movement um but we can talk about like how that happened uh, a little bit later mm -hmm. um but you know, so I got I got picked on quite badly. Uh, they used to make up names, and, and it was only really then that I realised I was different. I just kind of got on with it. You know, it was one of those things that if I wanted to do something, I just did it. You know, I found and I, I and I just adapted. Yes. You know. Yes. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's one of those things, and and it was when people started to notice it. That's kind of when I realised I was a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Start off you, with when you discovered that you were. Uh, <laughs> when you, you discovered that you were a little different, 
did you look at it as <clears throat> what prevented you from seeing it as negative? What, why did you take it on as a positive and begin to use it in some sort of way? Cause as we go on with your story, we're going to find out that you've accomplished quite a bit, including in sports. Absolutely. So how, what took place inside of you internally that said, okay, that's my left arm, but I can still achieve whatever. What, what was yeah, going so, on with know, your mind? It, it took a long time. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm quite an emotional, sensitive kind of guy. And, and when I was at school, when people started to pick on me, I just, I couldn't understand why someone would be mean. Yeah. You know, like I just, it just right. I'm not that way inclined, you know, to, mm -hmm. to be mean to somebody. Um, so I couldn't, I couldn't get it. And then, then I started getting all these sort of, um, oh, you know, I'm, I'm weird, I'm different, and started to look at myself in a negative way, actually. And that was when I was young. And it wasn't until I, um, it was about 2017, 2018, I decided to basically hit the, uh, you know, attack my fear and, and go, go at it. And I wanted to get rid of that fear of um, sort of how my, how I sort of look at myself, if that makes sense. Yes. So I did yes. accomplish loads of things. I didn't, I didn't let it stop me, but the whole loving myself, that didn't really happen until about 2017, 2018. Okay. So stop there again. What yeah. took place that made you go inside to say, I'm going to wrestle with this devil. I'm going to lick this fear and I'm going to learn to love myself. Was there a turning point? Was there a belief? Was there an incident? What, what was the deciding factor? Or what stimulated it? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I've never really liked looking at myself in the mirror, you know, and that's being mm. completely honest, you know, I found it really, really difficult. And for so many people that look at me, they don't, they say they don't notice it. And that's, that's fine, but it's something that I noticed. So whenever I picked up a, a photograph of myself or looked, and I, it was just, my eyes would be drawn to it. And I kind of got sick of feeling like that. You know, I just didn't, I, 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 this is not how I'm not making myself happy. You know, this yeah. isn't, this isn't good for me. Um, so I decided to launch a, a blog um, and an Instagram feed called Beating BPI, which is Beating Brachial Plexus Injury. And it was really designed for me to um, embrace it and to try and get over my fear. And, um, and very, very soon it became about other people as well. And I was networking with loads of other people that have got brachial plexus, um, herbs palsy, um, and I noticed that we've, we've all got a very similar sort of outlook on life that, you know, we don't allow it to stop us to do uh, the things we want to do, you know, and, and mm -hmm. that then led me on to um, launch a line of clothing called Accept and Adapt because it was learning to accept that I've got this thing. This is part of me and this is actually my superpower. That's how I look at it now, Joe. Like, Oh, I got chills when you said that. You're looking at it. It's your superpower. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know what's, you know what's hilarious? Like my, um, my, my son, my, my first son, he's coming up to three um, and he's obsessed with superheroes at the moment. Like, you know, he keeps on calling me Batman and he's Spider-Man, you know. Um, but I kind of think, you know, actually this is my superpower. This is, this is the thing that makes me different from other people. This is the thing that's opened up so many doors for me. I mean, I could talk for hours about the amazing things that have happened in my life because I've got this injury. This is fantastic. This is so inspiring. Um, first of all, I'm enough of an entrepreneur to take note that you said you had a clothing uh, site or a line about uh, what was it, Adapt? And, uh, yeah, so accept accept and, adapt. and where is that in case anybody wants to go? I'm a t-shirt guy. I'm going to go and buy a t-shirt there. It says Accept and oh, Adapt. Where, yes. where is it? So if you go onto my website, it's mattparsons.co.uk. Okay. Um, and on, on that website, there's, there's loads of links to all the different projects that I'm doing. So if you click on accept and adapt, you'll be able to see, uh, it'll take you directly to the store. The idea is that all the profits go to an herbs policy charity. Oh, nice. So it's not about me. It's not about raising money for me. It's about, we need to, we need to make this, um, this disability, um, we need people to understand it. We need people mm -hmm. to be aware of it because it can be prevented at birth. This is the thing. If people know about it, then, then, then it can be, it can be dealt with, you know, I should have been a C-section. The doctors should have right. known that, you know, and it's one of those things. Um, so yeah, I really want to sort of try and help, uh, raise some money and, uh, 
and, and awareness. This is beautiful. I, I totally support that. So we'll put the link up for that. And I'm going to go to the site too and buy some clothing. Uh, but also, I'm still curious about you're looking at what you, you have and other people are calling it a disability, uh, a limitation, and you're calling it a superpower. How do you get to it being a superpower? Give me a story. Give me an example. Give me an insight because everybody's challenged with something. And yeah. when they look at it, instead of saying, oh, that's a negative and that's a limitation and instead flip it and say, wait a minute, that makes me different. And it's a superpower. But how is it a superpower? Give me an example of how it made some sort of leverage and some sort of uh, you know, result. You see, for me, like if someone says to me, I, I can't do it then it just gives me even more reason to, to want to do it. <laughs> you know, and, you know, like it's I, the challenge. Yeah. And, and I, so I, when I was younger, I mean, I, I still can't, I can't turn my arm over. Like it's just physically impossible for me to, to turn my arm over. And I always dreamed of playing the guitar and, you know, as a guitarist yourself, you know, you need your left right. arm to be able to get your hand around, you know, and play the chords. Yeah. Um, but something happened and like intuitively I just picked up the guitar the other way around. Like, so I play, even though I've got a disability in my left arm, I play guitar left-handed. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, so it means I can strum and I can finger pick. Um, and you know, if we kind of go back to right to the beginning as well, that, um, basically if it wasn't for my herbs palsy, I wouldn't be in the job that I absolutely love. Like I love being a teacher. I love my work. Mm -hmm. Um, I wouldn't have met my wife. Mm. I wouldn't have the kids that I've got now, you know? So all of this stuff, like this, this superpower that I've got, like it's, it's opened up so many doors because I've not allowed it to stop me. If that makes sense. Oh, um, it totally does. It do totally does. Where did you get this idea within yourself though, not to be stopped? Is that from your upbringing? Did your parents instill some sort of self-confidence? Was that simply you being backed into a corner and saying, I'm not going to take it anymore? Was it, did you read something? Did you see something? What, did you meet somebody? I'm, I'm just kind of fishing for more of that inspiration yeah, came from. I mean, my, my parents were relentless. You know, my mum was doing, um, physiotherapy on me three times a day she's not a physiotherapist but we had a physiotherapist that used to come in once a week and give me exercises to do so my mum would spend hours every day kind of doing uh, wow. doing physio with me and uh, she's also a reiki master as well i don't know if you know much about reiki oh yeah of course um, yes yes yeah so i was trained in reiki when i was like 20 years old as well so you know it's something that you know i was brought up in that environment of um you know spiritual environment really and uh Yes, yeah, so with the physiotherapy, and it's like my mum was like, you, you, "We're not going to call this a disability. You know, you're gonna you're gonna do all of those things that all of the other children can do. If even wow. if you do it differently, you will be able to do it." Um, then, when, then when I got to school, I, I as I said earlier, I kind of went. I had a bit of a downward spiral because when you're a teenager, you start looking at yourself, and things start to you know you start becoming a bit more self conscious, um, and that's kind of when I, it was over to me really then to do it myself, you know, do those exercises, maybe go to the gym and do and take ownership of that really. Um, mm -hmm. And I think because I was getting picked on a bit, I, I kind of, I wanted to hide, you know, I'd wear long sleeve shirts and try and hide yeah. it. Whereas now, like, I just want to embrace, I want to tell the world that, that this is, this is, this is great. This is, you know, something that's, that's made me who I am. And I'm, I'm so, so grateful for it. I, I am, I, wow. you know what, if someone said to me, Joe, like, if there was an operation to get rid of it, would you take it? I would say no. Wow. That's a very revealing. You're not only owning it, but you have found the power in having it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. And so I know that you are an artist. We've looked at some of your art there. I know that you are an author. I've already seen part of the book that you've currently been writing. I know that you are a um, musician. You just talked about playing the guitar differently, but you also have recorded music. Don't you have an, uh, a label and your own yeah. album? So I, I decided to um, 
put some albums out there and I wanted to do it independently. It was, you know, I, you can spend hours and, and months and years going after record labels and, you know, and right. I just thought, you know what, I want to take ownership of this myself. I want to, I want to do it all. My, my, my best friend, he's, um, he's an incredible musician. Um, so he, I, I wrote all the songs um, and he helped me sort of arrange some of the strings. So we, we recorded a 16 piece orchestra for my first album in London. <laughs> yeah. Like, so when you go out, you go all out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't do, do things by halves, Joe. Like I, I just, I'm, I'm a big believer of like, it's honest and that's kind of come from you. You know, when you talk about inspired action, I really, when I, when I read that and when, when you said that, I, it just made sense. Like I, I, I don't, yeah, I just, I, it makes no sense to me to have an idea and then not act on it. Right. You know, it's like, well, you've been given an idea. Like, I'm with do you. something with it. Right, right. Well, if you got an idea and you don't take any action, then nothing. There's not even anything to talk about. There's nothing there to show. It's exactly. gone. Yeah. So, okay. So a musician, but didn't you, didn't you play cricket at some point yeah. and even represent your country? Do I have that yeah, right? It was my county. Yeah. My county. So um, it's, I guess it's a bit like representing the state in you know, mm-hmm. different states in America. So I, um, I, I lived in a, in a county called Northamptonshire. Um, and so when I was a kid, I, I was brought up around cricket. My dad was a, a cricketer. Every, every weekend, every Saturday, Sunday, we would go up to the cricket field and we would watch my dad play cricket. And it was a family event and there were other families there. And it was just, it was brilliant. We loved it. Um, but I developed a real passion for it. Um, and I don't know if you know much about cricket. Um, I know nothing about cricket. Oh, do you know? <laughs> I, I, bar- I barely even know what the sport is. I'm trying to conjure okay. up a movie I might have seen where they played cricket in it. Okay, okay. No, I won't go into too much detail then about, <laughs> about cricket, but um, it does require quite a lot of your, your left arm, especially when you're batting and you're fielding, you know, when you're catching, because a doctor said I wouldn't be able to catch a ball, you mm. know, and to, to then work out ways that I can catch a ball and then to represent my county as well. You know, so mm. I played up until I was 19 years old. So I, I was from 13 to 19. And at one point I wanted to go professional. That's kind of my aim really? was to go professional. Yeah. Be a pro cricketer. Um, but then when I, when I was going through school, it was my, really my art that was taken over. So I had to sort of go where I felt guided. And I think that's, that's another thing. Um, I sort of oh. mentioned to you the other day that I use what my mind and I use the word yes. mind, my yes. intuitive navigational device. Yeah. Tell me about that. I saw that in your, in your email to me and I thought, what is that? Yeah. This is so your label. I, yeah. I, um, I'm a big believer of intuition. So I kind of think of my mind, my intuitive navigational device, a little bit like a, a sat nav. So let's say, for instance, you know, I get in the car and I want to drive to London. So that's my goal. My goal is to go to London. So I get in my car and I type in London um, and I just let the sat nav do what it does. And it gets me there, doesn't it? Yeah. So that's, the, that's kind of what a sat nav does. And I kind of, <clears throat> we've got this built in navigational system to get us to our goals. Hmm. Yeah. So we ask the universe, we say, right, I, I want to, um, I want this kind of job. Uh-huh. And what we do is we, we, we program it. We say, right, that's what we want to do. And then what, and this is what a lot of people don't do. They don't let go. So we trust the sat nav. We trust the sat nav is going to get us there, yeah. but we don't always necessarily trust that we are going to get the um, inspiration or we don't trust that the universe is going to give us the thing that we want. Right. So I've really learned over the years that actually I need to trust my intuitive navigational device um, because it gets me to all of the places that I need to go, especially when I let go of that, um, mm. that fear of, of not having it. There's one thing that you didn't mention, it, not within the description, but you had said it earlier, that when you get in the car and you're using a navigation device and you punch in London, it yeah. tells you what to do and you yeah. do it. Yeah. Most of us, if we say, I want to publish a book or open a restaurant or fill in the blank, that's their goal. That's their intention. If their intuition says, go buy this book, they often don't do it. Yeah. And that's the missing piece for me as I'm listening to you. So knowing where you want to go, obviously I'm going to London or wherever you want to go. 
That's the very first step. And then when you're listening to your intuition, and I want to hear more about how you listen to the intuition, because it's very easy to be deceived by the ego, false beliefs, limiting beliefs, self-sabotage. But whatever it is that you're being told to do, you need to go do it. That's the inspired action that gets you from here to London. Yeah. So how do, how do we listen to our intuition? How do you, how did you learn to do that? I think it's, to be honest, there was a lot of trial and error, Joe. It was, it was, what, what am I listening to? You said, am I listening to divine inspiration? Am I listening to ego? And, you know, years ago, I I, I think I was, I was chasing the wrong thing. You know, I was a bit, I guess with the music, I think the reason I wanted to do the music was because I, I wanted to be admired. I wanted the fame. I wanted the fortune, right. you know, and I wanted that lifestyle. Um, and, but that was, for me, that was driven, driven by ego. That wasn't mm. a, a drive for necessarily, um, you know, the, necessarily the music. It was, it was, it was, it was that feeling of being wanted, um, which, I found out was actually I needed to sort that out myself. So when I started to love myself, mm. I could I could actually listen to my intuition a lot more. If that makes sense. Oh, that makes total sense, man. I got chills listening to you talk about that. I'm, I'm going to repeat it for the people listening and for clarification in case I I'm hearing it wrong. But what I'm hearing is originally when you were looking for the appreciation and the applause from the outer world, trying to listen to intuition was hard to do because you were listening to your ego and it can send you in all kinds of different directions. But when you started to love yourself, appreciate yourself and give yourself self-approval, which is not an ego trip that's self-nurturing and and you are blessing your own being now you're clear to hear the intuition that's coming in to say okay you can do music in this way and this will touch a whole lot of people but it's not about you seeking approval at that point because you already have the approval absolutely absolutely and what i also learned is that everything that I've done has led me to here. And I'm so happy Joe. Like in my life. I've got a wonderful job. You know, I've got an amazing family. I, there's, I don't, there's nothing else I need. You know, it's like, I, I've got <laughs> everything that, that I've ever wanted. You know, I've got it. And I've, I've done loads of different projects. I guess, you know, I could have a few million in the bank, but for me, it's not really my, my goal anymore. You know, my, my mm-hmm. goal was happiness. Mm. And that, and, and to be honest, that for me That's was, so good. that, that good. for me was, you know, I even remember back when I was, sort of 12, 13 years old. I remember like, I, I just wanted love. Mm. I remember listening to, <laughs> listening to, to, to my songs and I just sort of dreamt about finding my soulmate. Um, and yeah, it was a long, long journey to get there. And there was definitely a lot of, um, a lot of mis- well, actually, actually, I don't believe in mistakes. I was going to say mistakes, but I don't believe in mistakes. Um, but I, you know, for me, it was when I learned to love myself, everything else around me sort of fitted into mm. place and slotted into place and seemed to work. And mm. um, I could tune in to the universe a little bit easier um, mm-hmm. because I was coming from a place of clarity. You know, when I, if, when, when, when you meditate and I, I just, I just get ideas all the time. They just seem to drop into my head and, right. and you know, it's, it's just I know the things. feeling. That's why I'm chuckling. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. I, I got to ask you though, Matt, because I've heard this question from other people. How do you learn to love yourself? How did you learn to love yourself? That's a really, really good question. Um, and it's learning to accept everything about yourself. So for me, having mm. this, this disability was, was, was really tough to get my head around at times, you know, growing up, um, you know, especially when, when people were picking on me, you know, that's a lot of stuff to clear when, you know, mm-hmm. I, I really mm-hmm. took that personally. Um, and when you start to realize, actually for me, it was when I actually started to realize that this was my superpower, I started to think, actually, you know, this is, this, this has brought me so much in my life. Like I, I you know, the thing that I hated about myself, uh, I, I now love because of everything that's brought to me. You bring tears to my eyes, man. You are, you're so heartfelt and sincere and, and you're walking your talk here. Uh, I also know you have a film. Uh, didn't you make a documentary or, uh, about yeah. this? So again, around the time when I was, um, 
launching the Instagram uh, and the blog about um, beating brachyplex injury, I, I kind of came up with the idea of, of making a film about it. Um, so I decided, I just, again, I had an idea and I acted on it and I, I just thought this would be a great thing to do. So I, I got in contact with uh, the best nerve surgeon in, in, in England um, and he agreed to, to do an interview with me. Um, and network, again, like social media is incredible. Like it's, well, there's so much negative um, views on social media and you know to be honest i've been there before where you kind of get addicted to social media and you're kind of looking for the likes and looking for followers that's kind of the guess the negative side of social media but again it's brought so many i wouldn't be here talking to you if it wasn't for social media mm. mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. i wouldn't have done the documentary i wouldn't have done all of these different things if it were, and i wouldn't have the delorean which we'll, we'll talk about um shortly as well if it wasn't for social media so it can be a really powerful tool so I had this idea to make this documentary and I, I reached out um, to lots of different people and uh, there was just so much to be said in a future length documentary that I decided to do it as different episodes, a bit like kind of what we're doing here. Mm-hmm. Um, that we've got diff- I've got different guests, different people I interview um, and looking at, you know, even people have had their arms amputated because of this injury as well, because I'm quite mm-hmm. lucky in the fact that I don't get a lot of pain. So, because mm. you know what it's like if you trap a nerve or something, you know, it's, it's excruciating. Mm-hmm. So, um, for a lot of people that have got this injury, it, it is excruciating and they're in a lot of pain. So, it's, it's kind of looking at different people that, um, that have got this injury and how it affects them. And I really wanted to expose that and um, try and put some good out into the world. And did you do all the filming yourself? Did you run mm-hmm. the camera? Yeah, I do all the filming, all the editing. I do everything myself. Did you have experience in filmmaking before? I did, when I was at university, I did um, about a month of filmmaking. But I, again, I'm just one of these sort of people. I just like, if I want to do something, I just learn it. You know, you can go onto YouTube and you just, you just figure it out. You buy the right. software, you figure it out, you know? <laughs> I was self taught guitarist as well. I never had a guitar lesson in my life. Wow. Wow. Uh, my t shirt is a saxophone. You probably can't see it. And I taught myself to play the saxophone. I had bought one. I had heard a baritone saxophone one time, and it was with the band Morphine. And I, and I went, What in the world was that? What was that instrument? And I went and bought one before I knew anything about reeds or mouthpieces or how to play it or anything. And when it came, it was like, I, had, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> And I went on YouTube and just typed in, how do you play baritone saxophone? And that it's amazing what is out there is an ocean of information Absolutely. and it's all free and very smart people who love what they're doing. Take the time to say, here's the mouthpiece. Here's the reed. You put yeah. it here, you put it in there. And then you, you know, start practicing. And yeah. I've, I made a baritone saxophone album sometime nice. after that. I did get a couple of lessons in person with people, including Mindy Abair, uh, who's a Grammy nominated saxophone player. My whole point, and this is what I want everybody watching to get, is that I didn't have any experience, but I wanted to do something. And I went online and looked for how do I do this? Fill in the blank. You yeah. didn't have anything but some limited experience with the filmmaking and the editing, but you had an idea. You had a yeah. dream. You had a goal. You had an intention. Your inspiration, whatever you want to call it, said, go on YouTube, start there and you ended up making this film where is it at if people want to see all or part of it so again if you if you go to mattparsons.co.uk there, there are links to everything that i do there um but okay. there's a website called uh, beatingbpi.com mm-hmm. um and there you'll you'll find there's a tab called um exploring herbs palsy um so yeah everything everything's on on that website it is okay about i want to make sure i have the website it's mattparsons.co.uk that's it. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Make sure because it's different than what I would have here. All right. Now you have mentioned several times that you love what you do. What exactly mm. do you do? So I, I teach design technology. So it's, it's probably, I'm not sure if you necessarily have that in the States. Um, mm. So my job, basically I teach 11 to 18 year olds um, and I work in such a wonderful school. Uh, we've got 750 pupils there and it's, it's, it's just, yeah, it's such a wonderful place to be. And uh, again, it's quite, uh, it's a massive synchronicity how I ended up teaching in the first place, to be honest, Joe. Like I, I would never, never would have thought I would have ended up teaching. Um, and yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of get back to that in a minute. So I teach design technology, uh, which is basically uh, woodwork, metalwork, work on plastics, 3D printers, laser cutters so basically we 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 get the kids to design and manufacture products 
Wow. Um, so, uh, and, yeah, we do CAD CAM, um, graphics, uh, you, you know, you, you name it, we do it. Um, and that's kind of what inspired the DeLorean project as well. Yes, I definitely want to hear about the DeLorean. <laughs> Since you brought that up, and I'm sure everybody knows, but in case they don't, in the, the famous movie Back to the Future, the time machine is a car that was called the DeLorean yeah. that the professor had adapted with, I forget what he called all the different things, to make it go you know, back or to the actual future. So yeah. you guys are doing what to an actual DeLorean? Yeah. And how did you get the DeLorean? You said the social media had something to do with this. Yeah, so... So I've been a huge Back to the Future sort of geek, really, since I was... Oh, it's one of my all-time favorite movies, Back to the Future. I think it has all the lessons of life in it and reminders and entertainment and education and inspiration. It's a perfect movie, and I just... I've always dreamed of of having a DeLorean, you know, for 30 years I've I've wanted one. Um, (laughs) And I even wrote, when I I was 10 years old, I even wrote to the local... um, a car car museum because uh, they had one there i couldn't believe it and and I, I wrote to them and said oh please 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 can i sit in the delorean and they wrote back to me at 10 years old and they said yeah sure no problem um and so i've got this photograph of me sort of really? sat in this delorean at 10 but then you know 38 years old now we've got one and i you know i drive it every every week and drive it around the city and stuff um so basically i kind of pitched the idea to the headmaster of the school um it was one of those sort of really awkward moments where he, he was a new headmaster to the school and i was on duty with him in the playground um and i didn't really know what to talk about you know so i was like oh do you like back to the future and he's like i love back to the future um and i was like, right i've got a really crazy idea here uh, but hear me out um, and I, I said, why don't we buy a DeLorean? I want to put a team of pupils together. We're going to fundraise. We're going to raise 30 grand, 30, 40 grand to buy a DeLorean. But then, um, so we'll have a, um, business people, we'll have design people, we'll have marketing people who can get together. You know, we can put up, make some fundraisers and have this really amazing opportunity for them to network with other universities and to, to, to um, have leadership opportunities. Um, and he said, you know, that sounds brilliant. Let's do it. There's no other school that I know of in the planet that's done it before. Wow. Um, so, yeah, so then I, I put a thing. I joined the DeLorean Owners Club, and there's a Facebook group where they um, – it's DeLorean time, time Machine Builders. So I joined that as well, and I said, look, just been given the green light by the headmaster to, put, um, to do this project – Literally the next day, the next day, someone emailed me. Sorry, someone sent me a message on Facebook and said, I've got a DeLorean. I'm a movie car collector living in London. Do you want to do my, uh, convert my DeLorean for me? And I'll give you the money to do it. What? (laughs) Yeah. I know. Like, talk about law of attraction, Joe. Like, this is just crazy. And and everything that's happened since then as well. So I, I put out the intention... And, and you know what? why I attracted this a lot quicker than how I could have attracted it myself? Because I haven't got any limited beliefs yes. for the kids and for the school. Oh, so that's got, it. That's it. That's brilliant. Yeah. Yes. Great insight. Yeah. So I literally brought and manifested it in the space of like two days. And then for myself, you know, it's something that I've been trying to manifest for like 30 years. And you know what? I could have afforded, I could have afforded 10 DeLoreans 20 years ago. And I never bought one because I kept on saying, I'll buy one when I get more money, when I get more money, when I get more money. And then I never bought one. You know, uh, yeah. Let's put this on pause for a second because I want to illustrate a couple of things. First of all, you were able to attract this faster when it was for the kids who yeah. you love and yeah. you love that job. You love helping them. And this wasn't directly for you. What I have found is that most of us are like that when it comes to finding and attracting something to us personally, we're a little more resistant because in our mind, we have limiting beliefs about what we want and what we think we deserve. If it's for somebody we care about, we don't have limiting beliefs about them. What yeah. we want is a, they want the DeLorean. Let's get them the DeLorean. There isn't exactly. any, there isn't any block. There isn't exactly. any filter. There's no snags. A yeah. friend of mine, and actually he was my guitar teacher for a long time, wrote a book called Attracting for Others. And in fact, I think it's free. If you can go to attractingforothers.com, you can download it. And Attracting for Others has that basic concept that it's easier to attract for other people because you don't have or even know what they're limitations are. And in fact, this is a nice challenge for everybody watching. 
whenever you are anywhere and you hear somebody speak their dream, they, they want to do whatever it happens to be, ace their test or, you know, get some sort of deal to go through. And it could be your family. It could be friends. It could be somebody at a restaurant. It could be an Uber driver. But you hold silently inside yourself the intention that they get that that they attract that because you will up the odds of them manifesting it because you have no personal involvement in it. Your limitations are not involved in their creation and you can help them along. So Matt, you've illustrated one of the greatest things. We still have to do our own inner work. So if you still wanted a DeLorean for yourself, obviously you already had said that you could have had one way back. And for some reasons you stated and some reasons you might be in your unconscious you didn't want it at that time, but boy, you got one now and you get to play with it and you get to drive it. You said once a week, something like that. Yeah. Well, it's parked at the school. So like I can just take it out whenever, you know, the the owner just said, Oh, you know, just, yeah, it's fine. You know, just take it out. It's fine. I'll put you on the insurance. It's no problem. So so Um, there's a, the, the slide little, part of me that wants to know are you going to turn it into a time machine we are that's, that's that's what we're doing so he's given us the money to do it so and that's that's the design um so he, he's given it to us for two years and he's given us 20 grand um and so i've uh, luckily you know where the school i teach at is is in a city called coventry and it, it's 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 brilliant for engineering and so mm. coventry university um has got is 20 minute walk from from my school um and so I've, I've, I've been over there and, and, and they've said they can help us manufacture certain parts that we need. And so I'm um, basically the kids are now working out all the different parts that they need to turn it into their work. They're going to build the flux capacitor, Mr. Fusion. Well, you know, it's going to look absolutely identical to the movie car. Um, wow. And, and I've, I've also got two free 3D printers as well. Um, I managed to get the guy, a guy called Mike Lowesby, who was the guy responsible for DeLorean getting into production. He came in to do a, a lecture as well into the school. Oh, nice. Um, so, you know, so many things have happened um, through law of attraction, just allowing it to come in. And in fact, the headmaster said to me the other day, he goes, how are you doing this, Matt? Like, how are you doing this? And I was like, well, I know, but, you know, <laughs> I didn't really have the time to kind of tell him, you know, about law of attraction there and then. Right. Right. Well, he sounds like a guy who might be open to it. And also Absolutely. just to plant a seed in your mind, if you hadn't thought about it already, you might want to invite Michael J. Fox to come for the unveiling of it at some point. Yeah. He has his own challenges physically. Yeah, um, but as I understand, I've never met him, but as I understand it, uh, he would support a mission like this. Yeah, definitely. I'll reach out definitely when the time comes. No, I understand you're also teaching different things to your students and mindfulness. Is that something that has been relatively Absolutely. new that you're bringing to the table for them? Um, yeah, so it's it's something that was sort of established in, in the school that I'm at now. Um, it was something that I wanted to introduce to my previous school, uh, but for, for whatever reason, it, it didn't happen. Um, but I... It's it's so incredibly powerful. It's something that um, that I do in my my life, and I know again through through mindfulness you can get yourself clear, and then when you get yourself clear, you can attract more. You can learn more about yourself. Um, but I think mindfulness is such a such a powerful thing for for children to to do. Hmm. Um, well, wait a minute. What is your definition of mindfulness? Just so everybody's on the same page, that's watching this. Okay, so the, the course that I teach um, is called Dot B. So it's, it's designed for um, 11 to 18 year olds. It's an eight week course. So the idea is that they, they go through these different lessons. I teach them that there's a group of us that, that do it at school. Um, it, it's learning how to, uh, to control your breath, learning how to, to quieten the mind down. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's, especially when you're kids, you know, if you're doing, uh, you know, you've got, you go to school at eight o'clock, you leave at four, you've got six lessons, you're doing a, a maybe you've got a fixture for a club. Um, you've got all these different things that are going around your head. There's deadlines for exam coursework and, and there's, there's maybe relationship issues at school. There's, there's going through puberty, which, you know, is difficult for a lot of kids as well. You know, there's so much anxiety there. And the idea is that this course helps sort of, sort of make you aware of the sensations in your body to, to slow the breathing down, to clear mm. the mind, to help with anxiety, to help with self-confidence, with um, concentration. Um, and and it's, 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 it's a really nice introduction for, 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 for kids to, to, to get into mindfulness. I love it. I love it. And how are they taking to it? Are they open to it? Are they resistant or... 
you know what? Some some love it, um, mm-hmm. and it's. I always find when you're when you're teaching mindfulness, it's 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 easier in smaller groups, especially smaller groups when mm-hmm. they are open to it. So when you're trying to, it's almost like a sales pitch to to some of the kids because you get a lot of the cool kids that are not. You know, they don't. They, so I say, right, guys, you know, close your eyes, and they're like, they don't want to close their eyes. You know, they they just they just don't want to do it. You know, because no. they're kids. <laughs> um, and but I would say probably, you know, quarter of the kids that, that we deliver it to, they really take it on board, and then they actually, you know, a few of them have come up to me and said, oh, so you know, I, I did that last night. I I did some more mindfulness. I did. There's there's a, there's one that we call um, the meditation. So for, for people that are, are struggling to sleep at night. It's a meditation oh. that's designed to do when you get to bed to help you sleep. And that's, again, really good that you can uh, quieten the mind down to get a good night's sleep before you go back into school the next day. Wow. Matt, you are, you are so fascinating and we're running out of time here. And so I want to ask a few more rapid fire kind of questions here, but there are opportunities for you to also address a few things. So if there's somebody watching right now and they're, they're being inspired they're being motivated they're going somewhere close to the thought that if he can do it then i can do it but they're still resisting they're still not getting up what would be a pep talk or a a quote a line of advice a thing to do a tidbit a takeaway what would you advise them i think for me like it's just just having the the confidence to do it and confidence is a is a quite fragile thing um, but it's, it's knowing that you, you can't fail, Joe, like you can't fail. Yeah. I don't look at anything that I've done in the past and think, think I'm a failure in any way. You know, there's things that, you know, I haven't sold a million copies of my album. That doesn't make me a failure. I'm still a success because all of that stuff has led me to where I am now. If it wasn't for those things, I wouldn't be where I am now. And I consider myself very successful because I've got a wonderful wife, wonderful family. I've got a wonderful job that I love. I'm doing lots of different products, uh, sorry, projects. Um, and, and I did that because despite at points not having the confidence to do it, I just decided to, that's it. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. It's about me and my journey. Um, so I guess that's kind of the advice I would, I would give people. Oh, that, that to, is brilliant advice, but you also brought up another can of worms, and that's the idea <laughs> of failure. Because... I talk about failure a lot and I try to try to get people to reframe it and redefine it and actually replace the word with feedback. Most of the time when you try something and it didn't work out the way you thought it would work out, it did work out in some way. And what was that way? Get the information from it because you can adapt, you can accept and adapt and go in a new direction and probably profit and learn something that wasn't there before. But only if you drop the emotional connotation that's around the word failure, that makes people feel like a loser. Yeah. So if somebody's watching, they're going, yeah, but I keep trying these things and they keep failing. They're not working out. I've tried two, to three different things in the last three months and none of them were successes. Yeah. How would they flip? What would be your advice, suggestion? Well, it, it, it's, it's knowing as well. I think, I think deep down, I, I always knew that I wouldn't necessarily be a famous musician. You know, I... And if I really, really listened to my inner voice, I, I, I knew that. But I knew that I had to do that to get me onto somewhere else. And so mm. if something is failing, then you could, you've got to find a, maybe a new way of doing it, but also know that that's part of your journey. You know, so that might ne- not necessarily be the end goal. So the universe doesn't, you, don't, you can't predict everything in, in, in life. You know, you, you can't. Like you don't know, like the universe has, has a way of getting, getting you to a goal. Mm. So at one point, my goal was to be a musician. At one point, my goal was to be a property developer. Then it was to be an author. Then it was to be a teacher, you know, all these different things. But actually, all of that happened to get me to actually the point where the, the, sort of the universe almost knew what would make me the happiest as well. You know, and I allowed myself to get clear to let the universe tell me that this is actually what I want to do. So despite all these failures, failures, universe commas, like right. they 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 shaped who i am so every mm. failure every 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 project that you do that might not necessarily work is another learning curve and it's it's another way that you can sort of approach life and say well i've learned that what can i do differently next time oh this is beautiful matt again we're running out of time but i want to give you an opportunity is there a story or 
an experience that you really want to share or you were hoping I would ask about so you would have the opportunity to share because you can share it. Is there something that you want to tell us, you know, whether it is how you met your wife, which another yeah. is another law of attraction story, or you have a new child with this is only a week or so old, I think, or days, five days old. Five days. Yeah. <laughs> I can just hear him crying now, actually. So apologies if, if you can hear him. Um, uh, yeah. So I, yeah, I'm going to tell you the story about how my wife and I met. So I okay. went to a, a, one of the schools. One of the schools I went to, I absolutely loved. So I was one of the first people to, well, my parents that actually took legal action when I was born. Okay. Oh. And um, again, that's nothing that I, I was in charge of. That's a decision that they made. They won the case. So I was awarded you know, some money when I was, when I was probably about eight, t- 10 years old, something like that. That also funded my education. Um, so I went to the school, really loved it. Um, and then after I finished university, I, um, tried different jobs. Um, and then someone asked me to, to, to do a talk at my, at the school that I went to. So bear in mind, this is years and years later. I kept on bumping into the same guy. This guy lives in Hong Kong, right? And he was back in the UK twice over the year. And I bumped into him twice. The two times he was back, I just happened to bump into him. <laughs> and he said, um, can you do a talk for me at the school? I said, oh, yeah, great. You know, I'd love to. Um, and that talk, just to cut a long story short, that, that doing that talk at the school that I went to, like 20 years later, um, I got offered a job as a teaching assistant, right? Um, and then they trained me the next year. They paid six grand for me to be trained as a teacher. Um, and then through that school, I met my wife. Okay, so like, I mean, it's a, it's a long, long story, but that's kind right. of like in a nutshell. But if it wasn't for my disability, hmm. my parents wouldn't have taken the legal action. I wouldn't have gone to the school that I went to. I wouldn't have then 20 years or whatever later bumped into this friend who then got me into the school, who then did the talk and then got a job, got qualified, met my wife. Now I've got a happy family. Like, it's just synchronicity through and through. And it's it's important to reflect on how we've got where we are, and uh, and, and and sort of as you do that, you open up more synchronic, synchronicities in your life. Matt, I can't thank you enough. You've inspired me. Your story, your genuine heart, your happiness is contagious. Oh, it's exuberant. <laughs> I love what you're doing. I'm grateful for the art. I can't wait for your books to be done in the book that you were sharing with me, which is going to be coming out. And I'm going to go to your website and I encourage everybody to go to the website. Uh, So it's uh, mattparsons.co.uk. That's right. Yeah. Correct. And uh, can't wait to see you in person. Yeah. Well, when I get that DeLorean, because you, you, I think you're, you're closer, aren't you? So when I said, I, you know, I'll give you a race. <laughs> All right. <laughs> sounds great. Yeah, sounds everybody, good, everybody I'm Dr. Joe Vitale. You've been listening to Zero Limits Living. And what we've been doing is taking away your excuses. You can have, do, and be what you imagine. You can go for your dreams and you can achieve them. I want to thank Lux TV, Roku. You can watch the show on the Lux TV app, download it. You can watch it anywhere, anytime. You can watch the show on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire. I put up a website, zero limits living TV.com, zero limits living TV.com. All the episodes are going there. I want to thank Candace Barr for making this possible, Lux Media Studios for supporting me in doing this, Nick, who's running the cameras today. And I thank all of you for joining me. And as I always like to say, expect miracles. Glutathione is a big word. It's the body's own master antioxidant. It's a scavenger for free radical, bacteria, and viruses. There are no products in the market with the ingredient NASET. NASET increases the production of glutathione that's in our body already to strengthen and enhance our immune system, elevate sense of well-being, support muscle strength and endurance, cognitive function, and liver support. It helps with increased energy and blood sugar regulation. Get your bottle of GSH Plus from www.salvationnutra.com.